I often see comments where people refer to quantum field theory as my theory. It's not my theory. And so I thought I would go over a little bit about the history of the quantum ether and how it developed and some of the people that were involved. And this is just a few of the highlights as I like to think of it. And the first one I like to talk about is Maxwell. Maxwell, when he made his equations, even though this was probably not taught in school, he used an ether theory. And his ether theory involved vortices that would rotate in response to electric and magnetic field propagation. And he thought these vortices rotating is how the magnetic fields were conducted through the quantum field. Although he didn't know it was a quantum field at the time. He thought it was just the ether. And the thing that kind of frustrates me, if he had been just a little bit more imaginative, he may have modeled it as electric charged dipoles. There were vortices that were charged with positive and negative charges that were rotating. And if he'd just done that with given his influence, it would have changed the way that electromagnetic and quantum theory developed and the ether. Now the real start for the quantum part of the quantum ether was Max Planck starting in 1900. He wrote a series of papers from 1900 to 1912 where he discussed a theory that had a quantum oscillator with a minimum energy. And these, this is the energy of the quantum fluctuations that I talk about and everybody else talks about and what some people call virtual particles. I avoid the use of the term virtual because it implies they're not real when they are real. It's sort of like the use of imaginary numbers in mathematics. Imaginary numbers aren't imaginary, they're real numbers. It's just a bad name for it. So anyway, Max Planck started, and by the way, the Nobel Prize winner in 1918. Then, in 1906, the 1902 Nobel Prize winner, Hendrik Lorentz, realized that, haha, the ether may be made of Max Planck's oscillators. That perhaps these oscillators have the right conditions under which they could be the ether medium. And he did this in a series of lectures at Columbia University in 1906. So he traveled all the way over here, which tells me that he and his colleagues had already been discovering, discussing it for a long time. And there's even speculations or statements that Max Planck actually was the first to think that the ether could be made of his quantum fluctuations. Uh, but he never wrote a paper about it, so we don't know. Then, by 1913, Einstein, with his student Stern, had come up with the name zero-point energy. So while the term zero-point energy is looked down on to because of some people thinking that's where you can get free energy, and, well, that's not exactly how you get energy, but that aside, I don't use the zero point field term as much for that reason, but the zero point field and the quantum field are the same thing in my mind. And Einstein and Stern were the Nobel Prize winners in 1921 and 1943. Stern won his Nobel Prize for later work and is also well known for the stern gerlach experiment, which is well known and he didn't win the Nobel Prize for that either. By 1916, Walter Nernst actually wrote the first really good technical paper that came up with a ether, quantum ether, of the Planck type 
that was made with Planck's resonators. And he was the 1920 Nobel Prize winner for the third law of thermodynamics, and he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for that. Then next, we have Bose and Einstein. Bose was robbed of a Nobel Prize. He deserved one. And Bose came up with the idea of what happens if you have photons that are at Planck's oscillators energy. How would they behave? And he sent the paper to Einstein and they worked together to finish up a paper that is now famous for coming up with a new form of matter. And it involves matter at, or actually in some cases getting close to, the zero point energy. So once again, very important. Next, there's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is sort of flipping around Planck's oscillator math to say that you can't measure the pos position and the momentum of an object at the same time with a great deal of accuracy when it's at low energy. And so this is sometimes used as a major explanation of the zero point field, although the zero point field was already discovered and understood well before that. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1932 for this work. And then you have Dirac's. Dirac C, made of electrons and positrons. And Dirac, in 1930, and he would become the Nobel Prize winner in 1933, came up with the idea that there's an electron positron C. We called it the Dirac C. And it's a little different from the paired model because he had them individual instead of paired but it was a first step in this direction that you actually have a charge C with opposite charges of the same basic particle type, matter and antimatter pairs. So this was an important step in developing the quantum ether. And then we have Louis de Broglie, a few years later in 1934, realized that the photons themselves behave like they have a dipole in the middle. The rotating electromagnetic fields appear to emanate from a rotating electric charge dipole, and de Broglie realized that these could be a Dirac type electron positron pair. He was already a Nobel Prize winner, having won it in 1929. So that was the first step of having potentially an electron positron particle pair model of the quantum field. Although in my reading of de Broglie's papers, he never did speculate that I recall that the electric and magnetic fields of the photons were also made of these quantum fluctuations. Now there was a break in advancement during World War II, but after World War II, there was some key work that got continued. And one of the big ones was the Lamb shift, which was developed by Lamb and Beta. Lamb did the experiments and in 1947 published the results. In 1955, he won the Nobel Prize for it. And Hans Bethe, after reading the results, did a, famously did the calculation on a scrap of paper on a train trip. And he is the Nobel Prize winner in 1967 for other work. Um, he had a wonderful career all around. So those are two key men that came up with an idea, the Lamb shift, and Beta's idea was it was an interaction that involved quantum fluctuations. Then the next one was to me the big one. Casimir and Polder published their paper in 1948 on what's known as the Casimir effect. 
And in this case, he said, okay, the quantum field really is dipoles and it has van der Waals interactions. And we should see these van der Waals actions because two plates can be pushed together if they're close enough. It took almost 50 years, but he was right. And he died a few years later and didn't get his Nobel Prize that he richly deserved. But that was the key where here by 1997, by the way, I was, just, I was doing quantum field theory before the confirmation. So for me, the confirmation was a big deal. Here's confirmation that the quantum field does behave like electric charge dipoles and participate in van der Waals forces, which was a validation of the particle pair model of the quantum field that all these famous physicists I've named so far worked on. And then a year later, 1949, Richard Feynman came up with his Feynman diagrams. And in the first diagram he alone, he refers to virtual particles mediating interactions between particles. And so once again, we have virtual particles in the quantum field responsible for interactions between particles. Now, I don't agree with his interaction mechanism for the most part. I, I think it's more sophisticated and we have dipole to dipole to dipole interactions rather than just one dipole mediating the whole thing. We have an entire field of dipoles involved in most interactions. But that aside, the 1965 winner of the Nobel Prize was also an advocate for the quantum ether, in a sense. And even in a model of the photon, you can do a Feynman model where an electron positron pops out of the photon and then it goes back to being a photon. Or it can pop out given the energy and get a pair production, get an electron positron pair. And then another famous physicist, although not a Nobel Prize winner, John Wheeler, came up with the quantum phone in 1955, a few years later. And the quantum phone was another step in the model of this quantum ether as Planckian type quantum fluctuations, virtual particle pairs. And so with all these things, you can see how it's developed through the years with very famous physicists being involved. So I hope that gives you a good appreciation of a lot of the work that's been involved. And I skipped over a lot of things. So the quantum ether has been developed by a lot of very famous physicists and is behind a lot of research. It just doesn't get talked about enough. And so that's what I'm doing. So I hope you liked the video. If you do like it, share it with your friends, subscribe for more. And if you want to read about this research, I talk about it in my book, The Zero Point Universe. And I talk about all the problems that arise when you don't consider the quantum ether in my book, The Greatest Lies in Physics. And I want to thank my Patreon, PayPal, and Super Thanks supporters. And thanks to everyone for watching.